Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Duke, and welcome to our second installment of The Peanuts Gang, A Promise of Christian Redemption. Today, we're going to look at, as we promised Charlie Brown, the everyman at the center of the Peanuts cartoon. Uh, in many respects, he's the straight man. He's Andy Griffith to Barney Fife in the old Andy Griffith show. He doesn't have all the best lines. He doesn't have all the gags. He's not extravagant or flamboyant like Snoopy. He's not thoughtful and cute like Linus. He's not crabby and annoying like Lucy, but he is the heart and soul of what makes the Peanuts comic strip go. Uh, Charles Schultz himself thought so. Uh, there's very much about Charlie Brown that's uh, terribly autobiographical about Schultz. Schultz would go back and forth about that. He'd be confessional at some times, talking about how much he shared in common with his character, his primary character. And other times, uh, he would sort of disavow that a little bit, trying to argue that he was creating something that was uh, biographically neutral. But the reality is uh, that there is much in Charlie Brown that is Charles Schultz. And so uh, we think about the extent to which the Charlie Brown comic strips were published. I had mentioned last time that uh, the strip itself ran from 1950 all the way through the year 2000, when the last strip appeared in February of 2000. Uh, but even three years before, 1947 to 1950, Schultz had uh, experimented with a cartoon, a short cartoon called Little Folks that detailed the lives of these very young children, about four-year-olds. By the time Peanuts came around in 1950 and beyond, they would, be gra they would all graduate to be about eight years old. But in this uh, sort of across the decades view of what Charlie Brown looked at, looked like, it really is quite illuminating. There's the early 1950s, the little, the, uh, uh, the Charlie Brown of little folks and the first few years of the 1950s. Uh, you see the big round head, you see the soft hair, the little soft curls of hair. Uh, how expressive. It's, it really is remarkable how, m given that these are flat, one-dimensional comic book characters, they are basic, really basic uh, sketch drawings. How much uh, emotion, how evocative the faces are, uh, the body language are for these characters. In the early 1950s, you see that smile, that kind of half uh, quizzical, it's not me, little boy, pose of Charlie Brown in the 50s. I didn't do it, Ma. Right? Always in trouble. Why are you picking on me kind of attitude. Uh, the big soft eyes, uh, that round head. And by the time you get to the 1960s, you have full-blown, psychologically disturbed in some ways, anxious Charlie Brown. Boy, the evocative nature of that twisted, crooked smile. That's a smile that breaks hearts. That's the smile of somebody who is clenched on the inside. That's the smile of somebody who is in great pain, uh, fear of being ostracized, socially shy and awkward. Uh, that neurotic Charlie Brown, uh, that was the hallmark of the 1960s. Still full-bodied, still full-faced, right? But then you get to the 1970s. And socially anxious Charlie Brown becomes the Charlie Brown of ah, right? The Charlie Brown who, uh, who made the phrase good grief a catchphrase, a hallmark of his personality. And let that sink in for a second. Charlie Brown's famous catchphrase, good grief, is by definition a contradiction in terms, isn't it? It's an oxymoron. Uh, we've got the good and we've got the grieving, and those two things seldom go so, uh, together unless you're Charlie Brown. And Charlie Brown's whole existence, his existential raison d'etre, is a sort of good grief, right? That for all of his suffering, for all of his anxiety, pictured here with actual beads of sweat, uh, flying from his forehead. All you see in 1970s Charlie Brown, head thrown back, anguished scream, that big gulf that is his oversized mouth expressing his existential angst. By the time you get to the 1980s, you've got that, uh, those apostrophe, uh, uh, reverse apostrophe eyes, right? A little bit more speculative, a little bit more pensive. Uh, the, face, the features on the face, the, the, much more of a gap between the nose and mouth. Much more quizzical, as if he's sort of resigned to his fate. Charlie Brown has made peace with what he is. Uh, well, there's no peace, but he certainly made peace with who he is. Uh, and then by the time you get to the 90s, when Schultz was an old man, there's something gauzy uh, about the art. Uh, it changes a little bit. The shoes become more fanciful. Uh, the, the pose there for Charlie Brown, pointing in the direction of the future, uh, that kind of gauzy smile. It's almost as if uh, the Schultz of the 90s and early 2000s before he died 
the last decade of his cartooning. It's almost as if it's, you, you put a, a gauzy lens over the film of the, the camera of his imagination. And all the characters are sort of perceived through this idyllic, um, this idyllic gauze of old age, as if somehow he's mellowed, the characters have mellowed. It's almost as if you're in a dreamscape uh, in the last decade of Charlie Brown's cartoons. And so you can see there from uh, the span of over 50 years, the evolution of the character. Uh, and the golden age of Charlie Brown comics is considered the 60s and early 70s, the silver age considered the 70s. So what came before and what came after were um, afterthoughts in some ways, although the characters still created uh, great moments in, in cartooning, the ideas, the drawings, the, um, the witticisms of, of Schultz were as strong as they ever were in some respects. It's that period from the 60s into the 70s that really sort of defines the classic Golden Age Peanuts cartoon. And we looked last week at the very first cartoon featuring Charlie Brown. Uh, let's look now at the first Sunday cartoon to get a sense of these. Note how, and I've got, uh, if you scroll back to our de desktop here, I've got a, a little representation of this myself. You've got Charlie Brown as the little boy, right? And you can see in his uh, uh, unfully developed features, you can see in his diminutive stature. And notice how Snoopy was too, right? Snoopy is like the young Charlie Brown himself at four. She, he is a frisking puppy in every step of the word. By the time you get to the end of the Peanuts run, Charlie Brown has a much fuller face. He is now an eight-year-old boy. Snoopy is in some respects larger than life. He is filled out much like his master, Charlie Brown, has. And so to see the two images side by side cavorting through the fields is illustrative, I think, too. Uh, and if you go back to the image of the first Sunday cartoon, which appeared June 1st, excuse me, June 6th, January 6th, excuse me, 1952. Uh, so very early on, the, the Sunday strips were already taking off. Um, gave a much broader format than that four-panel gag strip. And you've got the lettering, the classic lettering by Schultz, which was a hallmark of his art, his comic artistry from the uh, time he started drawing cartoons till his very last one when he died, that beautiful lettering. You've got Charlie Brown there, minimalist background, a little bit of squiggly line to signify grass and flower, a picket fence behind him, and how young Snoopy was, right? Just a baby. And he says to Snoopy, let's play a game. And all the kids are surrounded uh, with, with the puppy. What shall we play? Let's play tag. And they're all running in different directions. There's no angst here. There's no anxiety here. There are none of the problems of the Cold War here. There are none of the lingering uh, problems of neuroses. There is no uh, five-cent psychiatry booth for Lucy yet. These are kids playing like kids. We, Charlie Brown says, without a care in the world. Puppy barks, arf, arf, little Snoopy. They're playing tag, you're it. Uh, Shermie is tagged in the next panel, right? Next cube. Tag, you're it, Shermie. Tag, you're it, Snoopy. Ow, all of a sudden we see. And it turns out that Snoopy's turn to tag somebody else. He takes a bite out of Charlie Brown's pants and removes the backside. Don't get mad, Charlie Brown. That's just his way of tagging. And you can see in those beads of perspiration, uh, in this case, anger, uh, the smarting of the buttock where the pant has been removed, uh, the grimace on Charlie Brown's face. This is a very raw cartoon compared to what it was going to be. And I also wanted to share with you, uh, dig up for you, the very first effort that was made to animate Peanuts. Uh, in 1959, Charles Schultz signed a contract with the Ford Motor Company to advertise uh, on the Tennessee Ernie Ford show. I suppose the parallel between Tennessee Ernie Ford and the Ford Motor Company were obvious to advertisers at the day. In case you don't remember, Tennessee Ernie, Tennessee Ernie Ford was a country musician, a singer who gave us most notably 16 Tons, the famous song 16 Tons, What Do You Get? Another Year Older and Deeper in Debt. The alliance between Tennessee Ernie Ford show and the Ford Motor Company produced in the minds of ad executives this first ever rendering of Peanuts as an animated cartoon. And now, from the popular comic strip Peanuts, here are Charlie Brown and his friend. Why, well, thank you, Charlie Brown. Thank you, Charlie Brown. What's the occasion? Has Charlie Brown had another baby sister? No. Ford has new economy twins. So he's passing out chocolate to God to everyone. Everyone? Yes, everyone. 
And there is the nucleus of our cartoon, our first animation. Uh, and it takes a while for them to tell you that they are actually chocolate cigars, right? When you think of the 1950s, they were marketing cigarettes to everybody. In this instance, uh, these cigars did turn out to be chocolate. But you have that wonderful introduction of Linus and his sensitivity, Lucy with her uh, brassy inquisitiveness. And of course, the, it, as early as 1959, you begin to see the fanciful, the extravagant nature of Snoopy as he walks up on two legs, right? He too has a cigar. He's very flamboyant in the way he operates. So to begin to see the very first comic strip of Little Folks, to see the first Sunday strip, to see the first animation, you could see how unrefined uh, cartoon a uh, animation was, certainly for commercials uh, back in the late 1950s, and how quickly that would evolve into what we know today, much smoother. But moving back to our story, Charlie Brown is the everyman, and I think that's in part because Charlie Brown is, on one level, not in every way, a reflection of the artist Schultz himself. Uh, how did the two of them go together? Well, Charlie Brown got his name from Charlie Francis Brown, a colleague of Schultz at the Art Instructional School where he, wa he worked after World War II. Remember those old magazines you'd get used to get? Sometimes you'll still see them, where you had to draw a turtle, right? You'd draw a turtle or you'd draw a picture of an eagle or you'd draw a mule, and you mail it in, and somebody at the Art Institute would evaluate it for your uh, artistic talent, and maybe they would provide you with a spot in their, their drawing school. Well, Charlie Schultz, after World War II, went to work for an art instruction school just like that, where he got his he really cut his teeth drawing cartoons on a daily basis. Schultz did give his own personality, despite naming it after a friend, a colleague at the Art Instruction School. Schultz gave his own personality to Charlie Brown, especially his hesitance, the, wishy -wa the famous wishy-washiness of Charlie Brown, right? All the characters, particularly the female characters, refer to Charlie Brown as wishy-washy. That was an attribute of Schultz himself and his endearing determination. Uh, Schultz himself had this uh, self-deprecating, uh, anxious, shy persona, uh, and yet he was absolutely relentless in his pursuit of his dream to become a comic. These were going to be the two polar opposite sides of our everyman figure in Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown is the heart of the strip. Schultz actually once remarked, quote, I like to have Charlie Brown to be the focal point of almost every story. So the whole universe of, of Peanuts is really Charlie Brown-ocentric. Everything revolves around him. And everything is thrown into relief by his very, very real, very human. In many respects, too, uh, Charlie Brown is the oldest character in the strip. His suffering has worn him. His anxiety, the daily trials, the uh, f failed love affairs with the little red-haired girl, the inability to kick the football, his need to be uh, psychologically evaluated for a nickel at a time by Lucy, all of these things uh, make him seem the most adult of all the characters in the story. Uh, and there he is among all of these kids who become uh, more or less like him or different from him based on the storyline. In a 1977 interview, Schultz observed to Charlie Rose, quote, 97, he observed, quote, I suppose there's a melancholy feeling in a lot of the cartoonists because cartooning, like all other humor, comes from bad things happening. And I think that's a beautifully expressed sentiment. Uh, why is there so much suffering, so much tragedy, so much alcoholism, not Schultz's issue, but in, in uh, literary artists, in painters, in sculptors, why has there been uh, so much tragedy? It has been speculated uh, that these kind of bipolar emotions uh, in art sometimes trigger uh, and, and give rise to the creation of great artists because it gives them an outlet, a way to tra uh, channel their energies when they're up and a way to reflect on them when they're down. And Charlie Schultz, certainly his character, Charlie Brown, seems to share a lot of those characteristics. And so uh, one of the things that I think is really remarkable about Charlie Brown, if you think about the next slide here, he's a little round-headed kid, a.k.a. the blockhead. I've not heard anybody really discuss this before, but it makes a lot of sense to me that here you have this little round-headed kid. That's what Snoopy, in the early strips, always referred to Charlie Brown as. He didn't even know his master's name, right? He was still part dog, Snoopy. Uh, it wouldn't be until the mid-1970s and into the 80s where he really lost pretty much all of his dog characteristics and became a walking, talking, thinking, breathing, writing, flying, dreaming character. Uh, very human in, its, in his aspect and his outlook. Uh, in the early parts of the strip through the early 1970s, there was much about uh, P uh, Snoopy that remained a dog. And so he didn't know his owner's name. He just called him the little round-headed kid. And so in this Sunday, uh, brilliantly uh, illuminated, colorful Sunday comic strip, uh, the classic Peanuts featuring good old Charlie Brown, there's Snoopy up on his legendary doghouse. My stomach clock just went off. Where is he? It's supper time, 
and that stupid round-headed kid has forgotten to feed me. Here I am, here I am, says the ever-attentive Charlie Brown. I apologize for being ten seconds late. Well, come on down and eat. I know what it is you want me to say, but I'm not going to say it, Charlie Brown says. I refuse to say it. It's ridiculous. You can starve to death for all I care. I can be just as stubborn as you. And I'm not going to say it, Snoopy turns his back on his master. Oh, good grief. All right, sigh. I also apologize to your stomach. That's better, Snoopy says. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. And that's the thing that is so remarkably endearing about Charlie Brown. He's a man of principle. He's a man who has boundaries. He's a man who knows, a young man who knows what right and wrong are, and yet he's always relenting. Uh, that phrase, like good grief, which is that tremendous oxymoron, right? That something can be good and grieving, that you could grieve in a good way. Uh, that suffering itself is in some ways its own reward because it does make you a different person, a more reflective one. That's always balanced out by I can't stand it. Charlie Brown is always saying, particularly at the exploits of, Su of S Snoopy, I can't stand it, I just can't stand it, but yet he does. And he always comes back, and he's always there with the, the supper dish, he's always back on that pitcher's mound, uh, trying one more time, he's always uh, willing to take another run at kicking that football. <clears throat> Excuse me, so you have the round-headed kid, the one-dimensional round-headed kid, who gets called by almost everybody else who's not Snoopy, a blockhead, right? The round-headed kid is seen through the eyes of a dog, uh, is a round-headed kid, but when seen through the eyes of his other, oftentimes very, not very nice friends, the other kids in the neighborhood, he becomes a blockhead. Here is young Violet Gray, right? She would become, uh, she was an important character for the first 10 years of the strip, and then she pretty much vanished uh, from the Charlie Brown pantheon. Little Violet Gray as a little girl, and she says, I don't care what you call me, Charlie Brown. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names can never hurt me. She huffs off, pigtails and all, before she turns around and calls him for the very first time in the penis universe. Charlie Brown is called a blockhead. All right? When we think of a little round-headed kid, we think of vulnerability. We think of youth. We think of somebody who's not grown into their adult shape yet. We think of somebody who's a little addle-brained, mush-headed, uh, very much Charlie Brown. We think of a blockhead. We think of somebody who is stubborn and thick and uh, uh, unyielding, somebody who cannot be, uh, an impression cannot be made on him. And so it is a remarkable thing that Snoopy really did understand Charlie Brown better, perhaps, than all the other little kids in the neighborhood ever did, that he could be, at one and the same time, a character who, whose catchphrase was good grief, grief goodness, uh, and a character who was both a blockhead and a little round-headed kid. But there was genuine suffering, genuine, the genuine tragic emotion in Peanuts. Uh, if you look at the next couple of slides, <clears throat> you've got, you go home, Charlie Brown. Go on, I said it, get out of here. All right, I will. Right, and he leaves with a, a big black cloud where he would be speaking. And again, I just take a moment here. There's Charlie Brown playing, and look at that face in profile. Right? It is a balloon face, isn't it? Uh, but it's an evocative one. You see just that little curl of the ear, right? In profile, he has no chin, right? That little tuft of hair that you see drawn on the front is just one little hair protruding. And the blocks are beautifully arc articulated by the artist's pen, the little drawn car on the right corner there, and Violet, always in a position of authority, like Lucy. Lucy was going to become the Violet character moving forward. You'll see in the early 1950s, Lucy's born as a little baby girl. And by the time the mid 50s uh, and er early 60s come, Lucy has become the same. And she's sort of caught up with Charlie Brown. That's the other really neat thing. Charlie Brown never does seem to, gr after the 1950s, grow. But Lucy catches up with him. Linus, who's Lucy's younger sister when he's born as a baby, he quickly becomes the same age, or roughly the same age as Charlie Brown. He's a character of great stasis in his everyman position. So besides the beautiful line drawings, you've got the, the wonderful toys on the floor there. You go home, Charlie Brown. Go on, I said. Get out of here. All right, I will. He storms out, leaves the house. Uh, you see that beautifully, again, articulated screen door. The way Schultz is able to suggest a screen door by just a little inter few interlaced lines uh, that don't even take up the whole square of the door. Uh, and then he stalks off. And then she goes chasing after him, Violet, very fickle. Hey, you don't have to go away mad, right? There's still enough guilt, I suppose, or conscience in some of the other little girl figures of the strip that she goes running after him after she insults him, right? But that gradually evolves into something else. You see the Violet of the next strip. Violet says, we're going to have a party. 
And we're not going to invite you, Charlie Brown, and the, the, the vicious smiles, the innocence, and the innocence of children in this strip. It really is put on display. And I think there's a, a beautiful point to be made there. We've all been around little kids, and they are innocent with regard to our adult behavior, but little kids aren't innocent, right? Little kids at very young ages know how to manipulate. They know how to get what they want. Uh, they know how to manage the adults in their lives. Um, the tantrums usually come when they have forgotten gotten how or they've exceeded the limits of their authority, their, their manipulative authority. But there is something about little kids, too, that every, all the emotions, both the positive ones, the angelic ones, and the wicked ones, the impish ones, how those things are really magnified in the child. Uh, and you see it here. These two girls, right, uh, they can't wait to track Charlie, down, Charlie Brown down on the playground to tell him specifically that they will not be inviting him to the party. I don't care, Charlie Brown says. Ha ha, I don't care. And he laughs in their faces. I don't care. He does a little dance down the street, right? I don't care. Ha ha, I don't care. He dances away, leaving the girls absolutely perplexed. There, uh, the dig at him, the, the way they hope to slash him to the very heart doesn't go over. And yet when Charlie Brown gets out of eyesight, uh, you see a very haunting final scene where a tree shedding its last few leaves, a very important uh, iconographical image for Schultz. Over and over again, Schultz did strips of characters standing before trees in autumn and the leaves coming down and, and made endless commentary on that and to quite poignant effect. All Charlie Brown can say is rats, right? Uh, it does hurt. But at least the Charlie Brown of the early stage here is enough to put a brave face on it, right? He will not let those girls humiliate him, make him cry in public. He defends himself until he's off on his own, and he communes with his own heartbreak. And it gets even more savage. The same set of girls over time, uh, it becomes again and again a trope for Schultz. There he is standing there. And again, that profile, there's something about the Charlie Brown profile. Uh, the mouth disappears in the profile. So all you're left with is, again, that curly Q of the U and then just that staring face. And the two girls take after him with scalpels. Well, what are you doing here? Go on home. We don't want you around here. Who asked you to come by in the first place? Nobody. Go on home. And that ubiquitous cloud. And look at the posture. I mean, just a slight sag in the shoulders, just the, the barest of crooked lines to signify his back. And that, all, that posture you see in the first panel where he stands upright, right? I love, his, I love Schultz's beech trees, right? Growing up in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, lots of beech trees. Uh, those, and and he, the, with those, a few really sharp pen lines there, he can convey that beech tree standing right behind Charlie Schultz, that rock-solid posture, that hand tucked into his coat, sitting there taking his abuse. The way in the second panel, his head's on a swivel now, right? You have these two shark-like mouths that are sort of gobbling into him, and all he can do is swivel, 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 one insult to another. And then that just crushing uh, the crushing artistry of that slightly slumped posture, the hands now out of the pockets drooped to the side, Charlie Brown's face fixed firmly on the ground, and that black cloud that hovers over him, right? That, just, that cloud that it, it seeps out of his own heart and soul and into the box, into the little bubble where the speech would come from. And then the girls reflect upon his exit after tearing him apart. You know, it's a strange thing about Charlie Brown. You almost never see him laugh. You almost never see him laugh, right? I mean, there's such poignancy in that. Uh, it, it, not just the poignancy of Charlie Brown and his posture, his pose, his suffering, his inner turmoil, but the, the genuineness of the fact that these two girls are unaware of their own hypocrisy. And I guess that's one of the major Christian message, messages of uh, Charles Schultz's Peanuts. It's this exposure of hypocrisy. It's one thing to be mean. It's one thing to be mean. It's one thing to be vicious. In a world of sharks, in a modern world uh, that no longer believes in eternal truth, in a world that argues increasingly that human beings are nothing but animals, it's perhaps not surprising, particularly to see little, little kids behaving that way, modeling what they see in their betters, the dog-eat-dog -dog world of postmodernism. Uh, having said all that, though, uh, hypocrisy doesn't exist in that kind of a world. 
In a world of simply animals and animal nature, then the whole idea of, of hypocrisy goes away. Schultz was very adamant that we had to have it. It is the fundamental relation of human life. And especially if there is a God, especially if that God is Christ Jesus, then hypocrisy becomes the natural impulse of human beings. To know what we should know, to be, we should be fully self-assured of what the outcome of our struggles are. Uh, we should have our faith firmly in the other world, and we should sort of live that life of quiet uh, abnegation in the face of greater uh, spiritual realities. But that goes away. Uh, the, hip the hypocrite, the Christian hypocrite, is particularly a theme of Schultz, but it's hypocrisy in general. And the ability of these little girls to be so savage, uh, but then ask almost with that innocence of children, you know, uh, to make in one and the same breath the observation, I wonder why he never smiles. I wonder why he doesn't. And the, the terrifying art, uh, art of the next strip, right? All you see is Charlie Brown, right? And obviously, we're, we're seeing the world the way Charlie Brown sees it. We're hearing it the way he hears it. There's that face. There's that twisted little half frown there, right? That slightly arced to the bottom line on his face. Those two uh, parentheses that uh, surround those two eyes, and then just the angst of his pose, and just ha, 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 being laughed at, being laughed at in letters written in outline relief to being out laughed at in letters with harsh black accent to letters being formally stylized, whether he's standing there moving across the hallway or sitting in his seat at his desk. He hears it, right? It's like an echo chamber in his mind. Uh, the kind of savagery that he's experienced as a little boy, and it's hard to call it savagery uh, when you think about the context of Peanuts, to think about Peanuts as being a place of really uh, such bullying and brutality. It is true to life in many ways. I think one of the reasons why it endured the way it did, it had such a, a long shelf life and still continues to move us, is it does call attention. It doesn't romanticize kids. It doesn't turn kids into cynical preteen um, um, not, hypocrites isn't the right word, cynical, preteen, whatever generation, right? Non-caring, sarcastic, and caustic. There's also, there's always that other side of this here, uh, that kids can be hypocrisy, uh, guilty of hypocrisy just like adults, and their hypocrisy can be every bit as wounding and savage as the hypocrisy of adults. But there is still something redeemably childlike, even in the worst offenders like Lucy, or in this case, Violet. But that panorama there of Charlie Brown, just here. And of course, there's no doubt that in his young eight-year-old mind, those laughter and that, those ha-has get magnified. He carries him, them with him, even when he's lost and, and walked away from the sight of the laughter. What's it like to be someone like child, Charlie Brown, an, an everyman, an outsider, right, whose every flaw seems to be on the surface, whose every uh, misstep seems to be documented in technicolor? So how to, but for all of that, we mentioned that his wishy-washiness, his inability to stand up for himself, his vacillation uh, in many respects, a hallmark of the artist himself, but so too uh, what I think endears Charlie Brown to so many people is he'd never quit. He's a quintessential American archetype character, right? The downtrodden sad sack uh, who nevertheless picks up, lifts himself off, dusts himself off, and, can, and carries on no matter what. I love this Christmas-themed Sunday comic where it's Charlie Brown between the two girls again. All of us got nice things for Christmas, except him, Charlie Brown says. It doesn't matter if he's only a dog. He's our friend. So you see, I thought I'd better take up a collection to get Snoopy a little Christmas present. Why, how nice. Yes. How thoughtful of you, Charlie Brown, the two girls say. And he's got his little cigar box, right, for money. I'll be glad to donate a nickel. I will too, here. It's so good of you to be going to all this trouble, they say. Yes, and to be taking up your own valuable time. Charlie Brown responds, all I have to do now is find a store that's open. And he leaves this encounter just glowing, right? The snow is on the ground. Love the way Schultz, again, by a few sweeping lines of ink, conveys snowbanks, right? You see the roof of the house in that third panel covered in snow, the wavy lines of the snow, another beech tree out front, stripped of all of its leaves. There he is, though, Charlie Brown, in the second to last strip, last panel, leaving those girls feeling empowered. 
He's looking after his best friend, right? Man's best friend. He's looking after that lonely dog on top of his, uh, his old red doghouse, who's the only person in the whole neighborhood not to get a present. And he's got his box full of nickels. Gee, those girls sure said some nice things. They always used to make me feel so inferior. I guess they don't think I'm so bad after all. And after he's out of earshot, they talk to each other. And she says, boy, what a dope that Charlie Brown is. You can say that again. And that's the hypocrisy, right? We saw the hypocrisy, the, the innocent hypocrisy of these two girls when they savagely tore Charlie Brown apart, but then had the temerity to ask, almost without reflection, right? What's his, how come he, how come you never see him laugh, right? After having created the circumstance that led to Charlie Brown's melancholy, they're unable to see their own role in it. Then you have this more savage kind of, extreme kind of hypocrisy. And so it's very subtle, the nuances in the strip. And imagining, Schultz wrote almost 18,000 peanut strips from 1950 to 19, from the year about the year 2000. So we're talking 18,000 of these. All subtle, uh, playing off subtle nuances of various emotions that appear again and again and again. Uh, living well is the best revenge. So there you have a, a, a cartoon where Charlie Brown uh, takes up his cigar box. He goes out and collects money for peanut for Snoopy. He does this knowing in the back of his mind that these girls, these little kids in the neighborhood, don't think much of him. But he feels empowered in doing it. Uh, we move to one more. Living well is the best revenge. How is the, what's the best way, if you're Charlie Brown, to live that life, that faithful life? And there they are at that wall, right? Linus and Lucy at the, uh, Linus and Charlie Brown at the philosopher's wall. Linus propped up on one elbow. It's where they talk about life's problems. They discuss concepts like grace and hypocrisy and forgiveness and suffering. And Linus says, I guess it's wrong always to be worrying about tomorrow. Maybe we should think only about today. No, Charlie Brown says, that's giving up. I'm still hoping that yesterday will get better. Now that's optimism, isn't it? Uh, the Lord and Savior Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, what Linus is, is uh, annotating here, right, notating. Uh, why are you worried about your life? Why are you worried about what you shall eat or what you shall drink or, or what you shall wear, your clothes, your body, what you shall put on? Is not life more than food and drink, the body more than clothing? Why? Jesus says, why? If you have the truth, do you worry about this? Linus expostulates on this. I guess it is wrong to always be worrying about tomorrow. Maybe we should think only about today. What did Jesus say? Let the day's own suffering be sufficient for the day, right? Only worry about what you can control. How much different? would Charlie Brown's life be? How much different would our lives be if we only allowed ourselves to worry today about those things we could control today, uh, right? I think that was what Christ meant when he said those powerful lines. But Charlie Brown amends this, right? He's, he's not greedy. He's certainly not rejecting the idea. But his eternal optimism, that which keeps him moving, I'm still hoping that yesterday will get better, right? There's a, an act of resignation there. There's a, a philosophical twist. There's a joke there, a little bit of humor there. Love the look on Linus's face when Linus in profile looks, puts his hand down from his chin and looks at him, right? How do you, if you're, you're making a traditional Christian argument like Linus is, right? You're trying to comfort Charlie Brown in some way by this philosophical theological lesson that's juxtaposed against the very uh, uh, rabid human lessons uh, that Charlie Brown has been learning from characters like Violet, right? So he's a little bit nonplussed, Linus. How do you respond to that? How would Jesus have responded to that? No, that's giving up, Charlie Brown says. I'm still hoping that yesterday will get better, right? And therapy. In the 1960s, of course, we gave rise to the therapeutic America, post-World War. Somebody once remarked that the post-World War II generation, the baby boomers, they were the first generation of Americans who had to invent their own problems unlike their parents who lived through World War II and the Great Depression, unlike their parents who lived through tough economic times in the First World War, going all the way back basically to 1776 and the pre-colonial period, right? Um, one crisis after another, one hardship after another, generations having to pluck themselves up by their bootstraps to build a better world to leave to their children, right? Well, along came the baby boomers. World War II had been won. Uh, the fight for democracy had, had tilted the balances. The world was safe again for democracy. The great fascist nations had been pushed back. Uh, the Cold War was still looming. It wasn't quite in the early, late 1940s. It wasn't quite as cold as it was going to get. 
And that's the generation that found the baby boomers. Their parents had come home from school, from war, uh, more money, the economy was booming. America was the superpower, primarily speaking, and a- immediately after World War II. Life was good. People were going to school. Suburbs were being built. Uh, all sorts of wonderful things were happening financially for families across the country. Middle class was absolutely burgeoning. And into this generation were born a group of neurotics, right, who did not have wars to fight, did not have depressions to suffer through, great depressions to suffer through. Nevertheless, you had the whole culture of the analysis, uh, the ana- analyst, the whole culture of depression and neuroses. Charlie Brown, of course, besides looking for religious and philosophical comfort for Linus, was oftentimes looking for psychological comfort, uh, analytical comfort from Lucy. And in this beautiful Sunday comic strip, there's Charlie Brown. This time he begins the comic strip in his slouchy posture, right? His hands dangling limply at his side, uh, head thrown forward with a twisted, sm- uh, twisted frown of sadness. I'm in sad shape. He stands before Lucy's booth. Good morning, sir, she says. Sit right. Always the market or always the capitalist Lucy, right? She's more interested in her nickels than she is in a nickel's worth of psychological therapy for him. Good morning, sir. Sit right down. Fine. I was afraid I might need an appointment. What can you do, he asks Charlie Brown when you don't fit in? What can you do when life seems to be passing you by? She takes him outside the booth. She goes for a walk with him and she says, follow me. Follow me, Charlie Brown. I want to show you something. See the horizon over there? See how big this world is? See how much room there is for everybody? Have you never seen other worlds? No. As far as you know, this is the only world right here? That's right. There are no other worlds for you to live in, right, Charlie Brown? Well, that's right. You were born to live in this world, right? Right. And then she yells at him, love the bowling over, right? Something about, something sense, so sensitive in Charles Schultz's own upbringing that merely to yell at someone was to send them careening head over heels backward. That's a remarkable observation, too. This is the era of Tom and Jerry. This is the era of the Warner Brothers cartoons. This is the era of violent confrontations between cartoon characters, right? People being knocked off their feet by bombs, by cars, people being run over, right? You think about uh, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. You think about Tom and Jerry knocking everything over in the house. You think about Sylvester the Cat. You think about uh, the Bugs Bunny cartoons. In Schultz's world, right, a harsh word was enough to knock you on your feet as sure as any Acme device that coyote could come over to take, the, to take down the roadrunner. It was a dangerous thing, words were. She yells at him and she says, well, live in it. This is the only world you know. If you don't have access to another world, if you've never been to another world, then live in this one, Charlie Brown. And she blows him out. He's completely flattened on his back. And then she hits him with the punchline, right? Five cents, please. And, you know, for all of uh, Charlie Brown's justifiable anxiety, uh, her advice isn't bad advice, right? Uh, this is the world we live in. Live in it. Try to make your way in it, Charlie Brown. Quit apologizing for everything. Uh, so even when she is being crass and bullying, uh, there's a kernel of truth that pulls Charlie Brown back to reality. So you got these two these two tendentious ways of looking at things, right? Charlie Brown is idyllic and he's a dreamer, but there are characters in the play that nail that down a little bit for him, that point out his own folly, uh, that point out his own pretensions. Snoopy is fantastic at that. Then you've got the other side of this too, when Charlie Brown sees himself as so uniquely flawed, so uniquely sad, so uniquely inferior, uh, something that has been uh, pointed out to him by other characters. Uh, There's always another character in the comic strip who will pull him back a little bit. And these are the tensions of life for all of us, right? We either, we, we human beings, we're uh, erratic creatures. We either overestimate or underestimate ourselves pretty much all the time. When we are not underestimating our abilities, our contributions, our uh, relationships, we're constantly overestimating our importance, our centrality, and our own egos. And it's that back and forth in life uh, that Charlie Brown so wonderfully, wonderfully symbolizes. The therapy continues. There's a very young Lucy Uh, at her booth, right? It's not even a full-blown stand yet. It's just a box. I have deep feelings of depression, Charlie Brown says. What can I do about this? Snap out of it! Five cents, please, right? Yep, snap out of it. The next one. So I bought Linus a new blanket. I thought I was doing the right thing. Hmm. I'm not quite sure how I can put this, Charlie Brown, but let me say this. 
In all of mankind's history, there has never been more damage done than by people who thought they were doing the right thing. Five cents, please. And that really profound sigh by Charlie Brown, right? Whenever you see the parentheses around the eyes, it's enough to break your heart. And that squiggly, again, squiggly, slanty frown of his, that sigh is powerful, right? Because he cannot deny the truth of her assertion. How much have we done to each other in the name of doing the right thing? How intolerant and how cruel and how uh, bigoted can we be? Uh, so doing the right thing, Charlie Brown, is not, and, and there's something really moral about this. The, I believe it was Jesus, right? It was the, certainly the Bible that pointed out that the road to hell was paved with good intentions, right? This idea that it's not enough as human beings, particularly Christian human beings, it's not enough to be right intended. Uh, intentions have consequences, actions have consequences. And so Lucy, for all of her bluster and crabbiness, fuss budgetry, for all of her uh, cruelty at times to Charlie Brown, she also uh, treats him with a kind of respect in telling him these hard truths. This is the only world you have, Charlie Brown. You've got to figure out a way to live in it. What can you do about it? You can snap out of it, Charlie Brown. You're not going to find your way in this world to be so inwardly reflective, right? That you have to take an outwardly uh, centered approach sometimes. That maybe, and Christianity is all about this, stop wallowing in your own problems and help other people. You think about that cartoon we just looked at where everybody got a Christmas present except Snoopy. So rather than dwell on his own misery, his own despair, he goes about raising money to buy Snoopy a present and that makes him feel better about himself. And that causes those two girls, particularly Violet, to treat him somewhat differently, at least to his face, right? And so you're getting this dynamic across Peanuts, which I think is very remarkable, too. And then, you know, uh, of all the uh, comic scenarios that we see again and again in a Peanuts comic strip, the Valentine's Day one is pretty tough, right? Who hasn't been there? The first time you fall in love, the first little red-haired girl who moves your heart, the first time you have that kind of a crush, it, it's like the ha, 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 ha laughter we saw in that one comic strip. Uh, love at this age, at, for the first time, is so dramatic and so magnified. <clears throat> and so we have here the existential mailbox. Charlie Brown has been going to the mailbox and mailing Valentines for seems way more years than he's been alive. At the same time, he's received none. And the poor mailbox is this jaded, weary mailbox who's used to people stuffing all sorts of stuff in it. Uh, he's now beginning to worry about Charlie Brown. A wonderful, inanimate conversation. Charlie Brown's personal home mailbox is talking to the big blue mailbox in the street corner. And they confer, right? I've been thinking the same thing for years, his personal mailbox says. And that flag, that flag that's turned down, right? It's never turned up to let Charlie Brown know there's mail waiting for him. It's always turned down and empty. So here goes our young protagonist off to the mailbox where he's going to drop in a valentine. You can see the heart on it, right? And the ma mailbox spits it back out. Keep your valentine, kid. Charlie Brown, determined. Bends over, picks it up, and tries to put it back in the slot. Spits it out again. If she doesn't love you already, a valentine won't help. It's as if Charlie Brown is oblivious to it, right? Back in goes the valentine. I've been around a long time, kid. I know how these things go. Back, he still slips it back in. Take it from me, kid. They'll break your heart. Keep your valentine. And finally, through raw determination, Charlie Brown gets the mailbox to swallow up the valentine, and he turns and walks away. Oh, well, the mailbox says, what do I care? That's a strange new mailbox down on the corner, Lucy says to his sister, right? And, and so you almost get the idea that uh, so unrequited is his love, not just his love of the little red-haired girl, but his love of humanity. So unrequited and sensitive is Charlie Brown in his love of the people and the animals, uh, Woodstock and Snoopy, and the little red-haired girl, so in love with the idea of being a pitcher, right, or kicking that football, so genuine and pure in his affections are Charlie Brown, that even the inanimate objects that have to watch this, they, their hearts are moved for him. Another episode, a lesson in tough love from a mailbox that Charlie Brown ignores. Speaking of mailboxes, one of the very earliest, one of the very, very earliest slides in the strip shows little baby girl Violet, baby Snoopy. And Violet says to Snoopy, well, hello there. You don't know me, do you? My name is Violet. Charlie Brown tries to get her attention. 
You're real cute, she says to that dog, touching him on the nose. Ahem, says Charlie Brown. And then after petting and stroking the puppy, she walks away. And the puppy has heart-shaped stars in his eyes, Snoopy does. But Charlie Brown says, and no one's listening to him, well, why didn't you introduce me? Right? And so in a, in a genuine exchange of affection between a little girl and a puppy, there's Charlie Brown and he can't even be heard, right? Uh, we make you wonder if he could even hear the mailbox trying to warn him. Uh, he, it's, an, it's a dog that doesn't understand and a little girl who couldn't be less interested. Uh, but there's Charlie Brown trying to insert himself. But, you know, he never loses faith. He never loses his determination. In, in, the sub- in another one, we see Charlie Brown leaning by the mailbox, right? Uh, leaning, leaning, leaning. Three of the exact same strip. Sh- Schultz did this to great effect. Um, the idea that you could simply, for three out of four panels, repeat the same image uh, and, and not have people think they were getting ripped off for their money, right? They're getting one panel when they expected three. It just a, a wonderful uh, device that Schultz used this repetition to convey uh, the, the persistence of Charlie Brown, right? The unfazed nature of his devotion to his idea. He leans, he leans, he leans, and then he turns to you out at the panel and he says, out of the panel, he looks at you, the audience. He's waiting for Valentine's. He knows that crooked frown on his face is now a crooked fi- a smile. What was a heartbreaking, twisted smile, uh, frown is now a kind of a sly wink at you that he knows, right? He's going to keep waiting, that he is not, for all of his grief and ag- anxiety, he has not lost his core faith. The Valentine's drama plays out again, right? There's Charlie Brown and watching somebody else use the mailbox. There is Violet mailing her valentines and charlie brown says sending out a batch of valentines huh i suppose there's a cute one in there for me her response why should there be i don't like you charlie brown his response couldn't you just send me one out of pity right cuts him to the quick but he has a response for her right he's he doesn't just leave it there couldn't you just send me one out of pity and he finds what he finds unexpected love in this next panel, Sunday comic strip. There he is reclining against an oversized, velveteen-stuffed heart, sighing. Let's see, today is the 16th, isn't it? Valentine's Day is over. Same old mailbox. I'd give anything if that little red-haired girl had sent me a valentine. Maybe she did send me one, but it was delayed in the mail. Maybe she sent me a valentine and it didn't get here until today. Maybe it's in the mailbox right now. I'm afraid to look. If I look, there's nothing there, I'll be crushed. On the other hand, if she did send me a valentine, I've got to look. And he pulls open the mailbox and boom, Snoopy pokes his head out and gives him a kiss on the nose. His response, I hate Valentine's Day with that wonderfully defiant smile on his face. But yet he did get something, right? He did get and we, what we always get when we look for love in the wrong places. We always find when one mailbox closes, another mailbox, the Lord opens another mailbox for us, right? He gets unconditional love in its own way from Snoopy, and he gets that kiss he never would have gotten. Uh, the paper valentine is replaced by a connection with his dog, which in his moments of reflection he sees, but not then. Right? So in other words, the suffering of, of, of Charlie Brown throughout the whole of this comic strip is quite Jobian. It's quite biblical. And one of my favorite comic strips, they actually discuss this. There's Charlie Brown on the pitcher's mound, having given up his ninth home run in a row. Nine home runs in a row, he says. Good grief. We're getting slaughtered again, Schroeder. I don't know what to do. Why do we have to suffer like this? This triggers a Peanuts gang biblical discussion of suffering. Schroeder reflects, Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwards. What? Charlie Brown says. He's quoting from the book of Job, Charlie Brown, says Linus. Seventh verse, fifth chapter. Along comes Lucy, right? Linus says, actually, the problem of suffering is a very profound one. Lucy's response, right? Shaking her fist as she always does. If a person has bad luck, it's because he's done something wrong. That's what I always say. In other words, Lucy's response is exactly the response of Job's friends. If, you, if you're suffering, Job, it's because you sinned against God. And of course, uh, Schroeder points it out to her. That's what Job's friends told him. But I doubt if, she interrupts, what about Job's wife? I don't think she gets enough credit. She was the one, you will recall, who basically told Job to curse God and die. Very Lucy, right? The conversation continues in that big panel at the bottom. Schroeder says, I think a person who never suffers never matures. Suffering is actually very important. Lucy says, well, who wants to suffer? Don't be ridiculous. 
a nameless kid says, but pain is part of life. And Linus continues, a person who speaks only of the patience of Job reveals that he knows very little of the book. Now, the way I see it, and once again, you're left with Charlie Brown's head on a swivel, right? Back like he did with those two girls, right? Tearing them apart. Now the theological arguments, right? Back and forth, back and forth. And you're left with Charlie Brown on his own in the last panel. I don't have a ball team. I have a theological seminary. In some ways, a seminary can be as big a problem as those two little girls ripping into him, right? Uh, if it becomes merely an academic exercise. Uh, Charlie Brown is suffering and all the theological debates in the world aren't going to move him that way uh, in the same way we've seen in, t in cartoons before. But his faith in human nature never wanes, right? As we look at the next cartoon, there's kicking that football again. No, he says, absolutely not. You must think I'm crazy. You say you'll hold the ball, but you won't. You'll pull it away and I'll break my neck. I wouldn't think of such a thing. I'm a changed person. Look, isn't this a face you can trust, Charlie Brown? She says, mooning at him. All right, you hold the ball and I'll come running up and kick it. And boom, she pulls it away. I admire you, Charlie Brown. You have such faith in humanity, right? That human nature doesn't change. That human nature is not going to disappoint you in its capacity to disappoint. But the lesson here is Charlie Brown's faith. You and I might call him a sucker. The character standing around might laugh at him in great big ha-ha-has. But the kicking of the ball is a faith issue for him, right? That it, without that faith, what does he have left? Look at the next cartoon, the colored version of this, colorized version of this. There he is again. She must be kidding. Charlie Brown, I can't believe it. Charlie Brown, I'll hold the football and you kick it. How long, oh Lord, he says. That's a beautiful thing. Like that very first picture from the 70s we saw, remember? With Charlie Brown's head thrown completely back, that big gaping maw, right? The sweat coming off his brown. But this is, this is where that picture came from, right? How long, oh Lord, right? Christ said that to the Father. How long shall I endure these people? How long, Charlie Brown says, shall we endure people the way they are? Lucy says, you're quoting from the sixth chapter of Isaiah, aren't you, Charlie Brown? Quote, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without men and the land is utterly desolate. Actually, she says, there is a note of protest in the question as asked by Isaiah. For we might say he was unwilling to accept the finality of the Lord's judgment. He thinks he's going to get away with one while she's philosophizing about theology. He runs up to kick the ball and she pulls it away. Her final response to him, how long? All your life, Charlie Brown all your life. How long will we live with human imperfection all our lives? Because it is not here that the answers are found. Two quick ones by way of, a couple quick things by way of closing. Charlie Brown learned that theological lesson very early in his life. As the characters walk by one by one, Patty and then Violet, believe in me, he stands on the street corner like a medieval prophet, right? A medieval monk holding a sign. Believe in me, believe in me, believe in me. Even Snoopy trots on by. So there he is sitting on the stoop. I just can't get people to believe in me, right? As if that kind of hectoring, as if that kind of assertion is going to do it. The bottom cartoon, he says, I feel good. I just got back from the grocery store and guess what? The owner and his wife both complimented me. They said I was a very nice boy. Linus turns to Charlie Brown and quotes the Bible. In the sixth chapter of the book of Luke, it says, quote, woe to you when all men speak well of you, unquote. So much for feeling good, Charlie Brown says. Notice what happens. Charlie Brown has adopted the philosophical posture of Linus. They've switched roles here, right? It is Linus who quotes the Bible at Charlie Brown to take away his joy in the compliment. Right? And so we see that come full circle as we move through it. But Charlie Brown didn't always lose. By the time you get to the gauzy 90s, right, you can see how different the drawing is. Remember in the 70s and 80s, it was always Snoopy dancing, Snoopy celebrating, right? Well, here in, in 1993, finally, Charlie Brown won the game. Last inning pinch hit home, home run. I hit a home run in the ninth inning and we won. I was the hero. And Sally's only response is little baby sister, you? Right? Notice that it's a question mark. 
Uh, what a beautiful way to end that particular strip. Uh, Charlie Brown dancing and spinning like he were Snoopy in the glory age of the 1970s for Snoopy, but it is Charlie Brown, and how much happiness comes from finally kissing that little red-haired girl or finally hitting that home run or finally kicking that football. Whether you do it here or you do it in the next life, uh, the, the character of Charlie Brown is an archetype for us, an archetype for what it means to be a suffering, insufficient, inadequate Christian, because to be a Christian in this world is to be suffering, insufficient, and inadequate before the task at hand. He is the archetype of that for us. And all the other characters, as, as interesting as they are, they merely shed light on that one harsh, but ultimately redeemable reality. We'll see you next time with a consideration of Linus and Lucy, those two Van Pelts, and how they beautifully frame uh, the situation that Charlie Brown, we find ourselves in. <laughs>